For many, the Spaghetti Western movement of the late 60s was arguably the last hurrah for the Western, long one of Hollywood's most popular genres throughout the 70s, unless it starred Clint Eastwood's, the genre simply sank like a stone at the box office. But of course, this didn't mean that Hollywood didn't try to revive it every now and then. The Missouri Breaks enlisted Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando, but the results were a disaster, and the same studio made an even bigger Western bomb a few years later called Heaven's Gate, which almost killed the genre for good. And even Clint Eastwood stopped making Westerns. But in 1985, funny enough, two big Western movies hit theaters. One of them, of course, was Clint Eastwood's return to the genre that he had long forsaken, Pale Rider, and would be his last Western until Unforgiven. And the other was a movie that's kind of forgotten now, but is an underseen cult classic that's just waiting to be discovered. Lawrence Castan's Silverado, which is this week's best movie you never saw. I'm gonna enjoy this. You're late. It's a bad start, boys. Yes, sir. That means we'll just have to get you people to Silverado that much quicker. All right, let's get going. So in this one, Scott Glenn plays a cowboy named Emmett who's just got out of prison after a five-year stint for a crime he didn't commit in classic Western hero fashion. He's a cowboy and he heads to a small town called Silverado to pick up his kind-hearted but deadly young brother, Jake, played by Kevin Costner. <laughs> and along the way, he rescues a gambler named Peyton, played by Kevin Klein, and a black cowboy named Mal, played by Danny Glover. Once in Silverado, these four fast friends realize the town is being ruled over by Emmett's old nemesis, who's in league with a former friend of Peyton's and is now the town's crooked sheriff, Cobb, played by Brian Dennehy. I never enjoy killing a man. Eager to settle down, all four men find themselves challenged by the ruthless factions that run the town and will have to unite to save the day. Well, one of these. This ought to do. Now, in addition to our heroes played by Kevin Klein, Scott Glenn, Kevin Costner, and Danny Glover, plus the villains, who are played by Brian Dennehy and a very young Jeff Fahey, there's a bunch of other people in this movie that are pretty notable for the era. There's John Cleese. As you may have guessed, I am not from these parts. There's Jeff Goldblum. Sheriff, I'm a gambler who'd like to run an honest game here in your town. To whom do I speak about that? Oh, it's not this gentleman. There's Roseanne Arquette, and there's Linda Hunt, who had just won an Oscar for The Year of Living Dangerously, in which she played a man. The world is what you make of it, friend. If it doesn't fit, you make alterations. This, of course, was Lawrence Castan's follow-up to The Big Chill, which had been a huge hit in 1983, and it helped establish Kevin Klein as a star. Making a big mistake. That's what I told him. So, as I said earlier, in 1985, a mini revival of sorts was taking place for the Western. Clint Eastwood had returned to the genre with Pale Rider, while writer-director Lawrence Castan, who was definitely riding high off the success of Body Heat and The Big Chill, not to mention his work on the screenplays for The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, got the chance to make his own Western epic. It was very much in the mold of a Golden Age, John Ford-era Western rather than the spaghetti westerns that were popular about a decade or so before. Silverado took the fun-loving, high-adventure vibe that Kasten had brought to his Lucasfilm classics and adapted it to the genre, making a thoroughly entertaining odor that really should have been a hit, but alas, wasn't really. It did very modest business, grossing $32 million on a $23 million budget. It wasn't a disaster, and by the time it hit video and Laserdisc, it probably eked out a profit. But, unfortunately, it had the misfortune of opening the very same weekend as Back to the Future. So, guess what happened? Nowadays, it's best remembered as Kevin Costner's first big role. Right. Now, why was Kevin Costner in this movie? That's an interesting story. You see, Kevin Costner originally played the friend in The Big Chill that committed suicide and who they're all uniting to mourn. There was originally a big flashback sequence in the movie that ran 15 to 20 minutes that explained why the character committed suicide, but Castan felt that the movie was simply more powerful, leaving his motivations a mystery. So, Kevin Costner was almost completely cut out of the movie, although if you watch The Big Chill now, you can see that when the corpse is being dressed at the beginning of the movie, with his hair being combed, it's very clearly Kevin Costner's body that they're doing this to, which is kind of interesting. 
It's strange though, because Costner is quite a few years younger than most of his co-stars would have been in The Big Chill, so probably was better that he was left out of the movie anyway. And what a hell of a role he got in Silverado, as it pretty much established him as a star overnight. Once this movie came out, Orion Pictures saw it and snapped him up to a contract where he got to do two movies that made him a massive star. No Way Out, opposite Sean Young, which was famous, of course, for that love scene in the back of a limousine, and then The Great Bull Durham. Back to Silverado. This movie is so much fun that it's insane to think that it never really spawned a Western franchise, as the movie kind of cries out for it at the end of the film. I mean, it's left wide open for a sequel, and it could have sustained a whole series of films. Heck, if a movie like Silverado was popular nowadays, I would bet that all four of the leads probably would have gotten spin-offs. Castan should still be making Silverado adventures 30 years later, especially with the fact that all four guys are still kind of going. I mean, Scott Glenn, Danny Glover, Kevin Klein, and Kevin Costner, heck, they could all still be doing westerns, and Kevin Costner, let's not forget, is still doing westerns, with him being the lead, for now anyway, of Yellowstone, and making his own massive western epic called Horizon. Maybe I love our man-to-man talks, but we need to set some goddamn boundaries here. This is definitely Lawrence Castan at his prime. He's now mostly remembered as a writer, but he was a heck of a writer-director back then and his writing and craftsmanship is on point right from the opening of the film, which finds Scott Glenn's Emmett descended upon by a gang of hired killers, who he makes short work of. After dispatching him, he opens the door to display the grandeur of John Bailey's scope cinematography, leading us on an adventure that doesn't let up for two hours. It's beautifully cast, with Scott Glenn making a case for himself as one of the great screen cowboys playing the Henry Fonda-like Emmett, a moral, upstanding hero who's a stark contrast to the spaghetti western anti-heroes that were more in vogue at the time. Even compared to Clint Eastwood, he's a real kind of straight shooting guy. You be careful. You're in it now. It's gonna get mean. He can always be relied upon to do what's right. He's kind of more of a Randolph Scott type than even a John Wayne type, really. He's ably supported by an atypically cast Kevin Klein as the smart mouth gambling man who's constantly at war with his own good nature, making him the one with the real hero's quest. You stand up real slow and let me see, you might live through this night. Klein rarely did action movies, but he looked really cool as a cowboy, and like Glenn seemed born for the role he ended up playing. And indeed, at the end of the film, he kind of emerges as the hero, although Scott Glenn carves up a way higher body count. Ditto Kevin Costner, who, as I mentioned earlier, was cast as a way of making up for the fact that Castan had cut him out of the big chill. What a favor he did for him, as you couldn't pick a better star-making part than this, with Jake, the live-wire young hero, with more energy than brains, but also a kindly nature that makes him easy to root for. And he also gets the best gunfight, where he goes up against Jeff Fahey's Tyree, which is a name that, of course, Castan took from a bunch of John Ford movies. That's the character that the great Ben Johnson always played in his films. It's no wonder that Silverado led to Costner becoming a huge star, and I don't think that he would have been cast in The Untouchables if he hadn't been put in this movie. And of course, that film, along with the aforementioned No Way Out and Bull Durham, made him a megastar. The heroic foursome is rounded out by Danny Glover as a black cowboy, which to this day is still a rare figure in American films, or at least was until Netflix recently had a hit with The Harder They Fall. Glover's character winds up being one of the deadliest heroes of them all, with him having a grudge against Jeff Goldblum's diabolical card sharp, leading to a cool moment of vengeance that, I wouldn't be a bit surprised, might have paved the way for his eventual casting in Lethal Weapon. The supporting cast is just as strong, with Brian Dennehy a very likable villain, and he kills a youngish, at least youngish, Richard Jenkins early in the film, who kind of looks like Richard Jenkins now. And then there's John Cleese of Monty Python fame, he typically casts as an Old West sheriff, and not half bad in the role, and the always cool James Gammon, who I always really liked in these movies. You brought a posse to my best hideout, and you asked me if I mind? Of the cast, I would say only the female roles really get short-shifted a bit, with it seeming like Rosanna Arquette's role wound up on the cutting room floor. Oh well. One also needs to single out the amazing score by Bruce Broughton, with helping to make him the de facto western composer of the day, with Tombstone being another of his great western scores. Castan would eventually get a chance to return to the genre with star Kevin Costner in Wyatt Earp, but despite some good moments, it simply doesn't hold a candle to the great Silverado or even the Wyatt Earp movie that it went up against, Tombstone. 
Lawrence Kasdan himself went on record saying that, despite having written The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, he's simply not the world's greatest believer in sequels. He thinks you should just make one good movie and move on. I'm running out of deputies. Fair enough, Lawrence. Fair enough. Silverado, of course, is available to rent and buy on most digital services and on Blu-ray and DVD with some pretty good special features. You can also find it show up on Crackle from time to time. While it never spawned a franchise, Silverado remains a Western classic that's just aching to be rediscovered, even if you're not a huge fan of the genre. Hopefully, those of you that haven't seen it will give it a watch, as it's a real gem. Bye, cop. Goodbye, Peyton.